Good afternoon, everyone. We're so, so pleased that you chose to join us today uh, for this very important critical topic on suicide prevention. We are here with a collaboration of two companies, PsychArmor Institute and StackUp. And together with a panel of veterans, we're going to be viewing a course that PsychArmor has in our library on suicide prevention and having a discussion around that. We really look forward to our audience participation as that discussion wraps up. Very quickly, through introduction, StackUp is a military charity supporting active and veteran service members from the US and allied nations by promoting positive mental health and combating veteran suicide through gaming and geek, geek culture. StackUp utilizes a comprehensive approach consisting of four pillar programs, supply crates, air assaults, the stacks, and the Overwatch program. PsychArmor Institute is a national nonprofit that has a mission of educating a nation in an attempt to bridge the gap between those who have served and their families in our military connected communities and those who support them in all phases of their lives. PsychArmor has hundreds of courses online, which are there specifically to try to encourage that understanding of military culture. I'm Dr. Heidi Kraft, I'll be your MC for today. And we are going to start off with an intro from our course. And welcome to Helping Others Hold On. We hope this course will give you a better understanding of the risk factors for suicide, as well as provide you with practical tools to identify that risk and even save someone's life. My name is Dr. Craig Bryan. I'm a clinical psychologist and the executive director of the National Center for Veteran Studies at the University of Utah. I previously served as an active duty psychologist in the U.S. Air Force and deployed to Iraq in 2009. I separated from the military soon after. Since then, I have focused my research and work on suicide prevention among military personnel and veterans. We would like to thank you, our volunteers, for taking the time to learn more about suicide prevention and veterans. Volunteers such as you are really making a positive impact in the world, and we are very pleased to provide you with the tools to help you make a difference. Suicide touches us all. Even if you have not personally experienced a loss of someone you care about through suicide, most of us are connected to someone who has. Over the past several decades, increasing attention has been paid to the rise in suicide rates among military service members and veterans. A large number of researchers have dedicated their professional careers to understanding and preventing suicide in veterans. For my own part, my interest in suicide prevention goes all the way back to graduate school. It was a passion of mine from the start of my professional education. My commitment to suicide prevention took a sudden turn, however, while I was deployed to Iraq. It was during my deployment that I came face to face with the reality of suicide. Working in a large hospital in Iraq, we too often received the bodies of those who had lost their struggle with suicidal thoughts. It was in Iraq that suicide became a personal issue for me, and my resolve to combat suicide became crystallized. These experiences have guided my research and helped all of us to identify and develop new strategies for helping others who are struggling to hold on and to find meaning in their lives. All of us want to be a part of helping others hold on when they need us most. As a volunteer who is dedicated to supporting the veterans in your community, this short course will give you some vital information on what to watch for in those veterans you are helping and anyone in your life who might be struggling. It will give you a few important questions to ask, and will provide you with a roadmap on how to help if you hear someone cry out for it. You do not have to be a mental health professional to save someone's life. Arming yourself with a little bit of information and a plan to help if you are needed is an important step in being part of the solution for a veteran who might need you. That was an intro clip of our course, Helping Others Hold On, narrated by one of the country's experts in suicide prevention and Air Force veteran, Dr. Craig Bryan. Today, I'm joined 
by my colleague, Matt Feldhaus from PsychArmor, as well as two of our colleagues from StackUp. Briefly, let me introduce the four of us and we will proceed with our watch party of helping others hold on and our guided discussion around this course. My name is Dr. Heidi Kraft. I am a former Navy clinical psychologist and spent nine years on active duty as both a flight and clinical psychologist deploying to Iraq in 2004 with a Marine Corps surgical company. I now serve as the chief clinical officer at PsychArmor Institute. My colleague, Matt Feldhaus is an army veteran he spent time in both the Army and the Pennsylvania National Guard, six years as a 35 Mike human intelligence collector, and formerly worked at the Institute for Veterans and Military Families, or IVMF, on America Serves program. Chris Coons is an active duty Army member, uh, retiring next year in May of 2021. Congratulations in advance, Chris. He is a communications engineer with combat deployments to Iraq in 03 and 05. Looks like we just missed each other. He has found passion in helping others and intends to continue his work in the field of mental health after retirement from the Army. Finally, Zach Kenny is a Coast Guard veteran, a former Lieutenant in the Coast Guard, who spent time in maritime law enforcement and drug interdiction among our country's heroes in our Coast Guard. I'm really pleased to be here with these three gentlemen and look forward to our discussion going forward uh, as we watch pieces of helping others hold on and then discuss that course. Again, this will be a guided discussion anchored around pieces of our course, helping others hold on, which has been in our library for over a year now, narrated by one of our country's true experts in suicide prevention, Dr. Craig Bryan, who wishes he could be here with us, but I'm looking forward to sharing this recording with him so he can hear what people think about his fantastic course. Please post your questions in chat or Q&A, and after we wrap up with our panel discussions, we will then have time for audience Q&A and discussion. Moving on from there to a quick poll of our audience, if you would, please. Very easy, yes or no. Have you been affected by suicide in some way? Take just a moment while everyone votes. Please vote in the poll. I'm seeing chats coming in. Go ahead and uh, vote in the poll. It should have popped up for you. Looks like our poll results, and we just did this very briefly, but 80% uh, of you said that you have been affected by suicide in some way. I know we had others saying they didn't, weren't able to see the poll, um, but I'm going to assume that at least 80% is probably a reasonable way to, per, to start this conversation, knowing that so many of us have actually been touched by suicide in some manner in our lives. Let's go on to the first clip. Let's discuss a few important risk factors for suicide. Knowing the warning signs is a first step in being part of the solution to prevent suicide in the veterans in our lives. Sometimes complications in a person's life are the things that are noticed by others. These include relationship problems, including communication difficulties and trust issues. Additionally, people are put at increased risk when going through financial, legal, or disciplinary problems. We found recently in some of our research that credit problems in particular are associated with especially increased risk for suicidal thoughts and behaviors. In addition, people tend to be at increased risk for suicidal thoughts if they're dealing with depression or post-traumatic stress disorder. These are both invisible wounds of war that can be seen in veterans, but are also common in people of all ages, genders, races, and backgrounds. Symptoms of depression include persistent feelings of sadness or a loss of interest in things that once made a person happy, as well as hopelessness about the future. Often, people who are depressed describe feeling that they are a burden to those in their lives, and they isolate themselves as a result. 
Post-traumatic stress disorder occurs when someone has lived through a traumatic event and suffers symptoms as a result. These symptoms can include avoiding reminders of the event, reliving the event, experiencing changes in mood and thinking, and feeling amped up or on alert. People with PTSD can also be at increased risk for thoughts of suicide as a result of these symptoms. If a veteran in your life has shared his or her experience with depression or PTSD, and you know that person struggles with these symptoms, that knowledge can help you understand what he or she might be dealing with and possible ways you might be able to help. People's personal histories can increase their risk for suicide, including the experience of abuse, either personally or witnessing it in one's family. A family history of suicide or a past suicide attempt also increases a person's risk. Another important risk factor for suicide is alcohol use. We also see access to firearms, insomnia, and male gender as being especially important risk factors, especially among military personnel and veterans. Okay, so having spent a few minutes hearing what Dr. Brian is telling us from his research as far as the risk factors in military personnel and veterans, I'd like to start with Matt Feldhaus, my colleague. Matt, based on either your personal experience or what you've been hearing through this course, what are some of the risk factors that you think we should all be watching for in suicide, uh, suicide prevention for our service members and our veterans, people that you know, have known, currently still spend time with in your life? Thanks, Heidi. Um, I think first and foremost would be behavior changes. If you're used to someone going always to the gym with you or on going to a run club or whatever the case might be for their you know, usual habits, if you notice that that has changed and they're no longer doing that for a continuous part of a uh, length of time, whether it be like a week, two weeks, et cetera. Um, that's one of the most noticeable things to me that something's going on. Another that's very commonly associated with that with would be uh, just kind of an overall change in their mood and temperament. If someone's typically a very outgoing, positive, smiley kind of person, and all of a sudden, they're a lot more stoic and, and, and you can just tell something's going on with them, like their vibe has changed. I think those are two important risk factors, especially in combination. So if you're starting to, to notice not only is their mood changing, but so are their behaviors. They're no longer doing a lot of the things that they usually did that brought them joy, that were routine for them. Those are two things that I think um, you, you need to be noticing and then try and uh, intervene in whatever way which I know we'll be getting into a little bit later. So I'll, I'll hold off on that. We will be for sure. Yeah, thank you. I think that what you're describing there is the paying attention to what you know about people, those, those service members and veterans in your lives, the way that they have typically been in your interactions with them uh, and paying attention to that, paying attention to when things change. Anything to add to that, Chris? Any risk factors that you've seen in people, uh, service members or veterans that you uh, know in your life that you wanted to add to that conversation? Ultimately, I think Matt kind of <clears throat> covered it. I, I think that you, you've also got to look for, uh, okay, if, if a service member's uh, contemplating suicide, they're going, th there's a possibility that they're going to start giving away possessions. They're going to start doing just little subtle things that are going to, kind of make you question why i mean uh private snuffy is giving away his ps5 that he just got three weeks ago and that 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 was his joy three weeks ago why why is he giving it away so that that might start some conversations and raise some questions sure just and for I, example. Absolutely, right absolutely as you heard dr brian talk about that that idea of something that was very pleasurable to someone that now that person looks like that person's lost pleasure. I think Matt discussed that. Uh, your run club, your gym, um, that video game console that you cared about so much, when you see that change, that certainly can be a, uh, oh, like a warning flag for sure. So yeah, very, very good. Um, in addition, of course, to those other clinical conversations um, that we were hearing about before. Excellent, let's move on to our next clip.
Most people who have suicidal thoughts are actually ambivalent about suicide, which means they struggle with competing wishes to live and to die. It's almost like they find themselves on a seesaw, where one side is a desire to live and the other side is wanting to end the pain. The good news is that, for the vast majority of people, the desire to live is easier to tip on the ambivalent scale. In other words, a small amount of wishing to live can offset a large amount of wishing to die. That's where people in their lives come in. Sometimes we are able to influence that wish to live in people who might be ambivalent and might be fighting that seesaw. We can tip the scale and help their desire to live win this inner battle. As a volunteer, you have the opportunity to affect someone's life in a positive way to be supportive and understanding and empathic on a day that he or she might really need that scale to be tipped. Another risk factor for suicide is suicidal thinking. It's important to note, however, that most suicidal individuals do not actually tell others about their suicidal thoughts. And they oftentimes do not say things like, I'm going to kill myself. In fact, research has shown that up to two-thirds of people who die by suicide never communicate suicidal intent to others, and in some cases, actively deny suicidal thoughts right before they die by suicide. As a result, it's important to provide you with insight into the thought process of those who might be suffering from suicidal thoughts or actions. Other comments that might seem vague are often much better indicators for identifying someone at risk, even though they're not explicitly talking about suicide. Here are some examples of statements that research has shown are very common amongst people who are high risk for suicide. People would be better off without me. I'm not worthy of respect. I can never be forgiven. I've never been successful at anything. I can't take this any longer. No one can help me solve my problems. This is unbearable. I deserve to die, or I don't deserve to live. If you hear any of these statements, or other statements that are similar to this, it's critical to reach out to that person directly. Do not be afraid to ask if he or she is considering hurting themselves or killing themselves. It will not increase a person's risk of suicide to ask this question. In fact, it could potentially save their life. Remember that seesaw? Often it takes someone caring enough to ask in order to tip the balance towards life. Pretty important and sometimes difficult discussion to have around the idea that it is sometimes not something that people talk about. Even if they're really struggling with those thoughts, we now know that uh, service members and veterans don't always talk openly about their thoughts about suicide. So Zach, I'd like to start with you here. So knowing what you now know about what Dr. Brian calls coded conversation, and based on your experience, um, what are some of the things that we should be watching out for when we communicate with the veterans in our lives, as well as those who might be their military connected families, uh, as far as being able to kind of connect with them and get a sense for what they might be up against? Well, you know, it's covered really well in that video because it's not always those statements of finality or the bold statements like, I don't want to live anymore or stuff like that. Those coded conversations are very important. Usually what we've been seeing a lot of is people's just questioning their self-worth, questioning their contributions to society. They just feel like they're a drag on everyone around them. Those are usually the people that we see that make those statements. And then when we lead into our questioning that we do at Stack Up about how like, you know, have you considered, you know, it sounds like you're making some pretty, uh, dis, you know, concerning decisions are you concerning hurting yourself have you thought about this you know and then we lead into how to discuss that with them and most of the time once i've never really run into someone that when we talk to them about it they they clam up they're like yes this is a concern because it, it goes back to that point where he talks about there's that point of them that still wants to live so they're gonna be like yes i've thought of this and that's where you work with them on that aspect Absolutely. Even though it's very difficult to discuss and there is great stigma around having these conversations, once someone broaches the conversation and asks the question directly, 
like you're describing? Are you thinking about killing yourself? That's a hard thing to ask someone, but it is the right thing to ask someone. And people tend to be very relieved that someone cares enough to ask. Chris, anything to add to this? Uh, yeah, kind, kind of like what you said, uh, Dr. Kraft, it, it's extremely hard to actually come straight forward and ask that, especially if you're not used to it and it, it's your first time experiencing it. Just coming forth and straight up, hey, are, are you gonna, are you thinking about killing yourself? That That's very difficult to do. Now with our veteran population, I, I hate to say it, we have extremely dark humor. We have very dark humor. So you, you need to know, we go back to what Matt said. We need to know uh, the individual in order to know, is this just normal for them? Is this just their humor? Or is it, is this abnormal for them? Fair enough. Very good. Very good point. Knowing each other. Big, we keep coming back to that, don't we? Knowing each other, taking the time to know enough to connect and to, to pay attention. Absolutely. Let's move on to our next clip. Research has shown that for military personnel, an especially important aspect of social support is feeling valued and respected by others. Military personnel who feel valued and respected by others are much less likely to report suicidal thoughts. Feeling valued and respected is much more important to military personnel than it seems to be for other groups. Among college students, for example, having people to socialize with or to spend time with is a much more important aspect of social support than feeling valued and respected. The importance of feeling valued and respected for suicide prevention shouldn't be too surprising when one considers the cultural values of the military, which emphasize respect, purpose and meaning, and commitment to a mission. One simple way to help someone feel respected and valued is to provide him or her a simple thank you. As people, a powerful driving force in our lives often comes from the validation of others. We all want to help and make an impact in the world around us. Often this is the reason we get out of bed every morning. For some people, it can become a reason to keep living. Without hearing the occasional thank you or other validation of those efforts from others, a person might begin to feel a disconnect between him or herself and the meaningful impact he or she is having in the world. Please remember to thank people. Sometimes something as simple as a quick acknowledgement of effort, even for a minor or a benign thing, can break up negative thought patterns and remind a person that he or she is actually contributing and making a difference for someone else. We often find ourselves stretched thin after a busy week of work or after multiple stressful events accumulate, resulting in the scale tipping in a direction that we wish to avoid. New research with the military indicates that burnout is correlated with increased risk for suicidal thinking. Another idea that can make a difference in someone's life is a purposeful scheduling of downtime. Once scheduled, protect that time like you would protect a business meeting. Not only should this be something that you do for yourself, but it's also important to reach out and invite others to join you. You never know when asking someone to be a part of something you schedule could actually be life-saving for that person. Participating in this scheduled break can benefit everyone who might be struggling. In addition, making it a group activity allows for someone who is feeling especially bad to be accountable to others. During this downtime together, look for a relaxing activity such as a walk in the park every week, watching a funny movie, um, or possibly even engaging in mindful meditation. If you see a veteran who might be overwhelmed, reach out to him or her and ask that person to join you in your scheduled downtime for the week. You never know the impact that experience could have in another's life. We spend about two-thirds of our waking hours at work. Fulfillment in our jobs is important to all of us, but for everyone, of course, work has ups and downs. Sometimes when work demands are not in balance or are particularly stressful, burnout can occur. Taking the time to talk to a veteran about work and factors that may be contributing to burnout is a powerful tool. Most people can create a list of things that could protect them from burnout. These might be factors we've already discussed. Scheduling downtime, working in exercise, enhancing your sleep, and engaging in social support. Having a plan and sharing thoughts, problems, and feelings is always a great way to lower stress and tip that seesaw in an optimistic direction. Finally, if you ask a person 
what gives you a sense of purpose or meaning in your life? You will likely get a variety of different answers depending on the person. This is a good question to ask a person whose scale might be tipping in the wrong direction. Talking about purpose in life lets someone reflect on personal goals and even reasons for living. Once you know this fairly personal answer, it's critical to be supportive. This can be as simple as saying, wow, that's a fantastic reason, to even possibly providing the veteran with resources or tools to help him or her continue movement toward that purpose. It can be life-changing for someone who might be struggling. Lots of information in that one. <laughs> Let's start with Matt on this next question. Matt, if a fellow service member or veteran that you know shows us or tells us signs of struggling or having thoughts of suicide, what are some little things we can do to help that person hold on? Yeah, the first thing I'll say is I'll focus on the do, uh, which if anyone's read, read the five languages of love, uh, one of them is shared experiences. And I think that is a universal um, way of showing someone that they're important to you, whether it's in, hopefully you know this person well, and you do whatever, something that you knew used to bring this person joy. Maybe you surprise him with a pizza and a glass of wine or a bottle of wine, or you go out for a run or you just try and share that, share a common experience with that person, letting them know that they mean something to you. Um, and say, you know, let them know that you care about this person and, and that is a, a really good act that you can do. The second is I think just actively listening to them, um, asking them if they're doing okay and, and pride just not trying to uh, give any judgment or, or share your opinions, but just actively listening and letting them know that, wow, uh, that is heavy. And I, I could imagine I would feel a very similar way. Um, and what I've learned to not do is try and convince someone that they, you know, that, oh, it could be way worse or anything like that, rather suggest that may maybe they speak to someone uh, about this, someone professionally. Um, and then also letting them know that, you know, under an empathetic guise that, yeah, that's a lot, very heavy uh, matters. And I could understand how you feel this way, you know, but I just want to let you know you're important to me or I love you or I would miss you. Um, I've, you know, read that those are, are good things to do that don't place judgment on that person for having the thoughts that they did. And that's something that you want to avoid. Absolutely. There, there's, that's such a big part of this. I think people, the stigma is around worrying about that judgment, right? Um, one thing we know from the literature, and it's an interesting body of literature now around suicide survivors, people who made an attempt and survived that attempt. They've given us a lot of very, very important information. And part of what they've told us that I think we can all take to heart is that if one person had connected with them that day, if one person had made eye contact, had smiled at them, had asked how they were, had, had in, engaged in a way like you're describing Matt, they wouldn't have made the attempt. And I think we, that's where we can all realize that you don't need to be a mental health provider to make a big difference. And what Dr. Brian's trying to say in the course is little things like saying thank you, um, like validating them, like inviting them to join something, so some of that scheduled downtime that matters, it can be life-saving, it really can. Thank you. Let's move on to our next clip. Asking people who you think might be at risk for suicide if they're having suicidal thoughts is the most direct method to connect with them and to provide them the help that they need. And it's very important to do so. You don't need to be a healthcare provider. However, there are cases where individuals may deny having these thoughts. Here are some additional questions you might ask to help a person and to keep them talking even if they are saying that they're not having suicidal thoughts. How do you know when you're getting emotionally overwhelmed? What sorts of things have been difficult lately? What are some things that help you to feel less stressed? What are your reasons for living? Or what are your reasons for not killing yourself? Another way to ask this question is, what is it that gets in the way of suicide? What keeps you alive? Who supports you in times of need? Remember, 
It's always okay to ask a person you're worried about if he or she is thinking of suicide or self-harm. You connect with the person and he or she knows someone cares and notices. This can be the difference that can save their lives. Such an important clip. Um, this is all about that difficult question. And really what we know now with no question in our minds is that that direct, directly asking someone is really the thing we can do to save lives, directly asking them. Now, what if they say yes? I think I saw that come in in the chat. People were kind of going back and forth. What if someone says, yes, I'm thinking about it. Now what? Uh, there are situations where we ask you then to stay with the person and help that person get to professional help. Uh, this is a service member or veteran who is now has now confided in you and you are now staying with that person while you're seeking professional help. Let's start with you, Zach, in your thoughts about this. Um, does this make you nervous? What kinds of professional help do you feel the most comfortable in helping a fellow veteran find? Well, it really depends on the situation, Heidi, but you know, most of the time, if they're active duty, we, we try and point them to like the chaplain, things like that. People that they could just, someone else they can talk to. And like you said, you know, once, once they say, yes, I'm concerned or I'm thinking about this, it's really key for us to focus on those grounding mechanisms. They can help them understand, hey, you know, your, your life is worth living. This is worth saving. So we usually like for us, it, we'll either point them to their chappy or someone um, if they're active duty. Obviously, we have to be careful there. We can't ask too many questions due to OPSEC. Um, otherwise, veterans, we tend to focus on uh, finding local resources for them. It's one thing to say, hey, well, you know, this would help you. It's another thing to give those people the resources they need, or at least a direction, so that way they feel a little bit more at ease with it. Sorry, I was struggling to unmute there. <laughs> totally agree with you. Um, so important to, again, we've got the same validation here piece where we're trying to validate without judging, stay with the person and then help that person figure out what is next. Um, there are a number of ways that we can help connect people to professional help. You're right, it's different active duty versus a veteran. Uh, we do have different things to, to uh, consider there. I'd like to go to you, Chris, for your thoughts on that as well. Okay. Um, yeah. So ultimately it's making sure that you are taking them, finding them the care that they need, whether it's the chaplain, mental health, uh, ha having, if, if they don't feel comfortable because there, there is still a, a little bit of stigma within the military. If they don't feel comfortable going to one of the, the organizations that are attached to them, whether it's their embedded behavioral health, their chaplain, their, uh, gatekeeper or whatever the branch is who, whatever the program is for each individual branch for suicide prevention, getting them to outside resources that can still take them as active duty veterans or as, or as uh, veterans, um, military one source, uh, vet centers, VA, um, things that won't actually come back on them or might alleviate some of their fears of stuff getting reported back to their command. Because, I, I mean, especially service members who have security clearances. One of the biggest things for us is, oh, oh crap, I'm, I'm, I'm going to behavioral health. My, my clearance is going to get pulled. Obviously a big concern. Um, and we, of course, would not be in a position to let them know what's going to happen at that point. Our most important and our only really acute uh, desire at that point is to save their lives. Um, Consider the Veterans Crisis Line as well, right? Um, this is a 24-7 line that is manned by people who know how to speak to service members and veterans about this. They oftentimes are veterans themselves, or they have a lot of experience with them. There is a specific line that goes straight to them who pay attention to veteran-specific issues around suicide prevention. I've handed multiple people off to the Veterans Crisis Line, stayed with them while they made that call, it was, a, it was absolutely a lifesaver. Let's go on to our last discussion question, which I'm gonna be asking all of you to comment on. It's kind of a follow on to this. So each one of us, everyone, everyone who's here today, um, who's here because they care about this very, very important issue, this epidemic 
of veteran suicide in our country. Every one of us can be part of a, 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 the solution, basically, right? That one person at a time, we can help our service members and veterans who are struggling understand that it is okay uh, to seek that help. Um, it is critically important that we do. Final comments from each of you on how you will intend to continue to play this role in the veterans and service members in your lives as we go forward. I'll start with you, Matt. I think this is gonna look different for everyone. Uh, and this is something that is authentic to me is that I know that I've had mental health uh, within my family. So I can say, I understand and I empathize with what you're feeling. And that is something that I can honestly say, you know, not everyone's gonna be able to say that, but I know for me personally, I think letting someone know that they're not alone in this, that their feelings aren't some really bizarre out of the normal, that we all go through these ups and downs and that you can somewhat relate and understand that someone would be feeling this way can help them feel um, unified in this battle. Um, battle as it is. So that's what, what I've done when I have a friend, colleague, uh, et cetera, going through something that I let them know, like, I, I, I get how you're feeling. Like I've been there before. We can get through this and adding in that, like we can get through this together. Uh, I love the addition of we. That's very powerful, Matt. Absolutely. Uh, Zach, how about you? You know, the biggest thing we always run into with this is, you know, just convincing them that it's okay to seek help. Um, you know, there's that old kind of mindset where it's, a, you know, in military, it's a weakness to, you know, have issues or need help or all that. But we do see that crop up pretty often when people come in, they're like, well, I don't know if this means that I'm not the soldier I thought I was or all that. It's important to convey to them that everyone does go through this and we will always help them find, you know, the resources they need to get through it. You know, they just all it, all it proves is they're human. And that, you know, we just, you know, there's always these downs, but the downs will always make the ups that much sweeter. You know, you're, you're, you'll go through trials and tribulations, but that just makes anything you achieve after that, that much, you know, better. And you got to try and convey that to the person you're working with at that time. I think you're, you're really um, kind of enforcing or reinforcing what Dr. Brian said in our course about helping people identify their reasons for living, right? Um, this is very powerful. If we can help people, take just that extra step to talk about the things that they are living for, the things that keep them from going down this road. Research has shown that that's one of the most powerful things we have as far as protecting people and preventing that suicidal crisis. If people can be able to be reminded of the reasons for living. So I think Zach, what you're talking about is an extension of that, um, helping them understand that they do have reasons for living. Chris, how about you to uh, kind of wrap up this thinking? So I, I think that one of the biggest things is when, when you're talking to a veteran or a service member or so, even a civilian who is dealing with um, these kind of thoughts, one of the biggest things is relatability. If they understand that you're not judging them, if they can understand that you've had your crises as well and you are going through it or you've been through it and might have a little bit more of an understanding on how to pull yourself out of it and get to the help you need. That is a great way to open yourself up for them to be more receptive to what you are trying to help talk them through, as well as uh, bringing up their grounding factors, whoever the individual is, whether it's uh, mom, dad, sister, brother, husband, wife, um, dog, cat, canary, wh whatever their, their grounding factor is, that is a great way to assist them in going towards the, the mental health help that they need because they're going to realize, well, if I'm gone, well, they might realize if I'm gone, um, Bubbles the Canary is not going to get fed every day. Yeah, there are pieces of that part of, of helping someone think through reasons for living when you talk about that support system or those pieces that are connected for them that can end up being part of why they choose to live, where that ambivalence, that seesaw gets tipped in the direction of living. So 
yeah, a really very important addition to these conversations is to help people work through that. Suicidal crises are really, really short, we've found. They last from a couple of minutes to maybe 15 minutes in most cases. So if we can help people get through those short periods of time where things feel out of control and where they're not thinking about all those factors, if we can help them focus on that, on the factors that are protective during those crises, if we can stay with them and get them the help they need, we can save their lives. Absolutely. Thank you so much, gentlemen. This has been uh, extremely eye-opening for me and hopefully for our audience. I would be uh, very pleased now, I think we're right on time, to be able to open up for audience Q&A. Uh, and I would, I'll, I'll be sort of asking all of us to be ready to answer these questions as they come in. Hi, Heidi, how are you? Thank you to the panel and all of our attendees for joining us today. Um, so one question for the group. I am the surviving spouse of a combat veteran lost to suicide February 2017. I fall into a category of those who discovered their loved one after or witnessed the suicide. During a session for, survivor, excuse me, for survivors like myself, I noticed we fit into two scenarios, a life event that was a catalyst, whether it's an arrest, relationship issue, legal issue, and those who never saw it coming. I am the second. I can't find research on these types of scenarios. What are your thoughts? Very, very complicated question. First of all, I'm so sorry for your loss and thank you for being, being so open with our panel today. Um, I'm glad that you have found a group of suicide survivors that you are doing some work with. That was gonna be my first recommendation because being around other people who understand that very, very unique form of grief that is found in suicide survivors is a really important first step. It is a unique grief journey that you are on and unlike anything else that anyone can experience. As far as the differences in how your loved one presented prior to the suicide, uh, as you say, there's not a lot in the literature around what that looks like for survivors. We do know that the way that, in your case, the way that that played out for you was traumatic. And so it's very important for you in your own healing journey to also be dealing with the trauma of what that was like for you. So I really recommend that you continue with your groups, but also allow yourself to get treatment for trauma because that is truly what you lived through. Um, gentlemen, anything to add to that? Well, I mean, you know, and we thank you very much for sharing that. And the best thing is that I could say is like, I've seen people that have come to us that are suicide survivors that want to help prevent other people from losing their loved ones. Maybe that's a good outlet. You know, you're here today, you're talking to us. We appreciate you sharing your story and, you know, you're, you're seeing this panel. So, you know, maybe, maybe, you know, that you can find some solace and use your information to help others prevent the loss of a loved one and, you know, to move forward that way. Thank you, Zach. I've seen multiple comments coming in on the chat also around uh, TAPS, Tragedy Assistance Programs for Survivors. They have a, a pretty robust program for suicide survivors. And PsychArmor actually has several courses narrated by TAPS uh, subject matter experts specifically on this. So if you'd like to check out some of those courses that may uh, add a little bit of information to what you're seeking. All right, Heidi, our next question is, where can I find research that was referenced about credit problems as a specific risk factor for suicide? That was Dr. Craig Bryan, who you heard narrating that course. And his research, if you look, uh, if you look him up, B-R-Y-A-N, Craig Bryan, he has a number of published studies uh, with active duty specifically, with active duty um, airmen. Uh, specifically, and he has identified a number of risk factors in active duty populations, and he is talking about his specific research. Um, so you can look up the studies that he um, actually published. All right, our next question is, would a veteran listen to a civilian who has never served uh, but attempts to assist? I'm going to turn that over to the panel. I think, I think I know what the answer is, but I'm going to turn it yes. over. Chris, you ready? Yes. 
yes, a a a veteran will listen to a civilian. We actually have a lot of um, civilians who are on our veteran are, are on our vo volunteer staff for crisis intervention who deal with veterans on a regular basis. A lot of times, veterans can actually take better advice from civilians because n knowing that a civilian has has mental issue or mental health issues as well and having that relatability is beneficial um it's not necessarily just a veteran wanting to seek a veteran a lot there are some who will only talk to veterans about their problems but the majority will take help wherever it is because if they're coming to us in stack up they will uh th there's times when we don't have a veteran for them to help. And we've had a lot of success with the um, civilian volunteers who have helped. Agree, anything else to add, Matt? Yeah, um, not that I disagree, but this is just an overstatement. I think for many, not just veterans, but other uh, minority groups that it does matter that you come or the person comes with uh, an attitude of respect and a tone of appreciation. And I think that does matter. So whether um, it's you know, sexual orientation, gender, veteran status, et cetera, if even though you might not fit under that same category, but if you come with a tone of respect and understanding and empathy, that makes all the difference. So tone does matter in, I think, these circumstances as well. So Yeah, res respect for a different culture, right? Absolutely. Got another one for us, Catherine? Oh, I surely do. We've got dozens of questions. Um, so here comes the next one. I've been told by active military personnel that admitting struggling with suicide thoughts is perceived as detrimental to one's career and standing. So I think we talked about this earlier. Uh, if that is true, what can we do to assess and help? Boy, it's gotten a lot better. It's gotten a lot better in the military, uh, including active duty, but it is still very much veiled in stigma. There's still very much a perception that admitting that is, is going to be a problem. Um, I guess, Chris, you're our active duty guy. Anything to add to that? I, I, I actually apologize. I, I was uh, replying to somebody who was asking about stacked up, stack up. Um, so for, forgive me, could, could you repeat the question? Absolutely. So the question is, I've been told by active military personnel that admitting struggling with suicide thoughts is perceived as detrimental to one's career and standing. If that is true, what can we do to assess and help? So the perception is there. It's not accurate, but it is there. Um, now you will have leaders who, if you, if you go to mental health, you'll have the toxic leaders. If you go, they'll, they'll give you hell. Um, we're, we're trying to weed those out and get rid of them and have a positive climate for, for growth, for our service members. Um, one of the best ways to, to help them is to just assure them you're doing something that's going to, to better yourself. And that's going to, in turn, make it so that you are a better soldier, sailor, airman, marine, um, coasty. I, I had to throw that in there for Zach. Um, but it, as long as you are just letting them know that you are, the individual is trying to do something that is going to improve their career in the long run, that can actually hold a lot of ground and help the individual actually go seek the help to improve themselves. Agree completely. What I used to say when I was taking care of active duty Marines was this is the bravest thing you've ever done, right? Acknowledge it as really brave, really courageous to seek this, to seek this help. Um, and that, that also seemed to matter. Next question. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, we have a question about a lot of details out there about mean safety. Um, if you could describe what that really uh, means, what it entails, and then and how can family and friends limit that sort of access? 
That is a whole other webinar, <laughs> um, but it's an important one. Uh, we know the literature is very, very clear now that if you limit access to the means of suicide that the person was planning to use, that person does not go find another way. Remember I was telling you suicide crises are very short and we call it constricted cognition. The thinking gets super, super limited. We're not really able to get flexible at that point. So if you can limit access to the means that the person was planning to use, you can save that person's life, no question now. Um, for us in the veteran population, we tend to have more access to firearms than our civilian counterparts. And I would assume my panel, my fellow panelists would agree. Um, veterans and their families have firearms. So because firearms tend to be a very lethal way that people choose to attempt suicide, it's extremely important if we're concerned about someone who has suicidal thinking to have that conversation about firearms in the house and how we are going to limit access to those firearms. As veterans, I'm sure we have lots of ideas about this. We can separate ammunition from the weapons. We can lock the weapons and give the key to someone who's part of this trusted, um, trusted group. Heidi Craft is not saying you should take weapons away from veterans. That's not what Heidi Craft is saying. What we're saying is this can be a collaborative conversation. I would like to ask my co-panelists to weigh in on this. Zach, you're up. No, I agree completely. And you know, the biggest thing is, like you said, it's a very short duration where that decision is made. And then, you know, not only that, that that person should be, you know, you should trust someone with those the, the means that you know would protect you, but not just not just someone that'll deny you access, someone that'll help them, you know, realize what they're doing is negative and work through it. Now they're like, well, why do you want access to this? What's going on? You know, talk to me, how are you feeling, what you doing? So that component adds to that. You know, it's not just, you know, preventing the means, it's helping them understand why you're denying them access to the means because you care and it's not out of malice. So that way, you know, they don't, you know, because, you know, someone who's suicidal, sometimes they'll tend to flare up and get angry. And that's how you kind of try to talk them down in that regard too. And what you're also describing there, Zach, is that connection that we've been talking about all along. Matt, anything to add to this one? Nothing that you guys haven't covered. You guys are the experts in this one and I don't really have too much experience with this. So thank you though. Chris, anything to add? No, I, I think you guys kind of covered that one. Yeah, it's, it's, it's acutely important right now. This is one of the most important kind of movements we have in, this, in the veteran suicide prevention space. Um, we have to talk about it. We have to talk about it with each other. We've got to have that connection. And again, non-judgmentally, talk through it with someone. It, you will find that you will be able to have this conversation. You can. People will chat about it with you. They'll talk about the way to make sure that they stay safe. Heidi, we have time for one more question prior to wrap up. The question is, I was coached that one is supposed to ask directly, are you thinking of ending, ending your life, killing yourself? But not to say if you were thinking of hurting yourself due to the fact that they don't see it as hurting themselves because their pain will be over once it's no longer there. They don't see it as hurting, hurting anymore. Can you clarify on this? And Dr. Brian used the phrase hurting yourself for that question in the video. Yeah, he did. I think that he would today uh, agree with you that we're sort of evolving through this, this conversation. Um, hurting yourself can also be a self-harm kind of thing, which is a different, we're talking about a different situation. There can be non-suicidal self-injury, which is a different conversation. So I think it gets um, a bit more complicated when you add the hurting yourself. So to your point, we are evolving, I think, to feeling that for the purposes of what we're trying to achieve here, um, are you thinking of killing yourself is the direct way to do that. All right, Heidi, um, you know what? We do have one more quick question because I think it's uh, great, uh, something to address. Um, help for the family is almost impossible and stereotypes put on the spouses and assumptions about relationship issues are often directed towards the spouse by family and friends. Where is the help for the family of the veterans? 
uh, well, <laughs> there's this is a this is a, again what a huge question. Um, families are such an important part of our military culture. We we our families serve with us, and I think all, everyone on the panel would agree. Um, it is sometimes harder for families to find the same levels of resources as are available for active duty or for veterans, um, but they're out there and there are a lot of resources that also take care of families. Uh, anything from the panel as far as uh, good ideas you have for this particular question? Well, you know, um, for me, it's going to sound like a, sh a shameless plug, but like at Stack Up, you don't have to be a veteran to reach out to us. We're an example where you could be a family member or a friend or someone that's in that situation and resources like us do exist where you can come and talk to us. You know, the biggest stigma is, you know, a lot of people, we see it, you know, well, I wasn't service, but I'm in a relationship or in the life of a service member and I'm going through this. You, you can still reach out to us. We'll still gladly help you. you know, everyone matters in that regard. The Veterans Crisis Line will also work with family members. Many, many veteran service organizations will. Um, but yes, seeking your own help is vitally important. All right, Heidi, that concludes our portion of the Q&A. Uh, we have lots of other questions that we'll try to review and address for the audience after this. Uh, take it away with the takeaways. Okay. Uh, obviously, it's been a, I, I'm sure I say obviously because I hope it's obvious to everyone how much of a, um, uh, an honor it's been here to be here today with my fellow panel members to talk about this vitally important topic. I think everyone who's here with us today cares about this and one at a time we can be part of the solution. A couple of key takeaways I think from our course and our discussion, watch for those warning signs, connect with people so you know what their warning signs are. Pay attention to coded conversations. Sometimes people won't say it directly. In fact, many times they won't, but they might give you hints that they're struggling with reasons to live. Small everyday things that we can do like validating people, thanking them, including them in your, in your um, downtime and your pleasurable events can really make a difference. Like I told you, suicide survivors tell us that sometimes it was just that one little thing that could have really changed their path. Really importantly, it is okay and it is the right thing to do to ask a veteran or service member directly if he or she is thinking about suicide, if you are concerned about that person. If the answer is yes, stay with the veteran and get professional help, whether that is the Veterans Crisis Line, 911, the person's doctor, the local ER, get professional help. Every one of us has the ability to intervene and save a service member or veteran's life. Thank you all so very much for being with us today. Thank you to my fellow panel members, Matt, Chris, and Zach. It's been an honor to be here with you today. Thank you for your very honest and open and heartfelt uh, contributions to this discussion. Every one of us can be part of this. And I have been honored to be here with all of you as we have had this very important discussion. Please feel free to come and visit both Stack Up and Psych Armor see the kinds of resources that both organizations offer. We are in fact here to be part of the solution and we hope that uh, all of you will reach out if you have any further questions. <laughs>